Welcome, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. Thank you so much for being with us this weekend. I hope you're having a good summer, that you're finding some time for yourself, some rest. If you're a parent, I hope you're soaking those kids in. I've started to realize I only get so many summers with my kids while they're still at home. So I'm trying to be very intentional with that time. I know summer just seems to fly by. Make sure that they're not on their devices too much because we as parents, we hear that them being on devices too much is bad, right? It's supposed to be bad. In fact, I saw this tweet. It, It made me laugh. It said, I heard someone complain that kids being on iPads is harmful, but when I was growing up, the top entertainment option was risking your life at an abandoned construction site. So I guess we're just trading harmful for harmful in some ways, but I can relate with that. If, if you're not a parent in the room, maybe summer for you is all about just taking trips. Maybe it's hanging out with friends. Maybe it's seeing family. I hope that that's that kind of summer for you, but let's be real. I know that there's many of us in the room that summer is not relaxing. Summer, summer is not rest. Summer is not vacation. Summer is a grind. Summer, we have to keep working. Summer, we're busy. I know that to be true. And if that's you, if you're in the room, I have some good news for you today. And that good news is that today we're going to focus on rest and getting some rest. So my hope, my prayer for you today is that you leave here feeling a little rested, if not feeling rested today, that you're optimistic about rest in your future. Because we're going to be talking about those two things, the good news about our future and rest and how they go together. And we've been in a summer series called Good News, and it's been journeying through the book of Romans and just hearing all the good news that the Bible has for us. Because we live in a world full of bad news, don't we? So sometimes good news is a refreshing breath of air. And this week in particular, we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 8. And oh, what a chapter, chapter 8 of Romans is. I heard a pastor describe chapter 8 of Romans this way. He said, if the whole Bible were a gold ring, well, then Romans would be a diamond on that gold ring. And then Romans 8 would be the sparkle in that diamond. Romans 8 is a chapter of rest. Or it was, was for Paul anyways, the author of Romans. You see, Paul spent the first chapters of Romans really struggling, journeying through, looking at the world, really seeing the world. He's saying, church, I've looked at the world and it's all bad. Everything is bad and it's distressing me. And then in Romans 7, Paul starts to look inward. He starts to look at himself and he starts to get a little bit of, of depressed about his, even his own state. He tries to be encouraging. He tries to push people to realize that there's hope, that there's good news, but he's pushing, he's grinding, he's struggling. He's trying to get the message out there, and it's not till Romans 8 that we see a demeanor change in Paul's writing. In Romans chapter 8, you finally feel like he's resting. Why? Because in Romans 8, he's looking at Jesus. He goes from the world, looking at the world and feeling distressed, to looking inward and feeling depressed, to looking at Jesus and finding rest. Finally, some rest. And rest is something the majority of us, we're just not very good at, are we? I mean, I know it's always been a challenge for me. I can remember one time in particular, I was in my early 20s and I was working for a company. I don't know if I'm supposed to say the company name, so I'll try to keep some discretion. Let's just call it a red and khaki bougie Walmart, okay? I think some of you might already know what I'm talking about. I worked at Target. We'll just go ahead and say it. I worked at Target as a manager at Target. I started to work my way up into leadership in my store, started becoming a manager in my store, which means I oversaw multiple departments. And I can remember one summer in particular that uh, the Bodine family, the whole extended family, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, my grandma, everybody was going on a family reunion trip to Lake Powell. And not only was I invited, of course, I'm a part of the family, I'm invited to go. I wasn't the black sheep, but could have been, but I I was invited. But not only was I invited, my whole trip was paid for. I didn't have to go out of pocket for this trip. So it was a free trip for me. And this same summer, I can remember clearly, we were getting a brand new store manager at our Target store, which means I was going to have a brand new boss in my world. And she was arriving the same week that this trip was supposed to happen. And I remember being stressed out. I remember being conflicted about, do I go on this trip and go on this vacation and relax with the family, or do I stay here and make a great first impression on the store manager? 
And then I just started spiraling out of control in my thoughts. I started thinking, gosh, if I go on this trip, she's, not, she's gonna think I'm always on vacation. The first week she gets here and I'm on vacation, she's gonna think I'm always on vacation. She's gonna start to rely on other people. Other leaders are gonna start to become her favorite. She's gonna realize she didn't need me that first week. And so when I get back, she's just gonna let me go. We didn't need him now, or we didn't need him then, we don't need him now. She's gonna fire me. I'm never gonna get another leadership position again. That's gonna go on my resume. In fact, I don't know if I'll get another job again. I spiraled and I spiraled and I spiraled. And so I ended up declining going on the family vacation. I thought, I just need to stay. I need to work. I need to grind. No rest right now. Well, boy, did I work. Boy, did I grind. I can remember this one day in particular. I worked for 24 hours straight. You see, that morning, we got a call that our district manager, so my store manager's boss, was coming to our Target store to do a visit, which a visit is just a fancy uh, term for Target lingo. It's basically he's coming to give the store an inspection. He's going to walk aisle by aisle, department by department, and inspect everything. And I wanted my departments to look the best. I wanted my departments to shine. So I worked and I worked. I went back to that stock room. I found everything that was to go in the departments that I oversaw and I got the shelves stocked. I stocked and I stocked making sure there were no empty holes on any of the shelves, just everything was full. I worked a full shift just stocking and working, stocking and working, I got done. And I thought it's still not good enough. I could do better. So I worked late into the evening, into the early morning hours, just pulling everything forward, making sure everything was right on the edge of the shelf, perfectly straight. You went down the aisles, all the labels were turned the right way. It was something out of a commercial. I stocked and I pulled forward and I, and I turned things and I made sure perfection worked and worked and worked. It's the middle of the night, still not good enough. So I started cleaning, I started wiping down shelves, I started cleaning signs, I started cleaning the scuff marks off the floor. You could see my reflection and that shiny target floor, uh, that's how clean they were. I wanted to make sure it was the best. And now it's 7 a.m. the next day. I've been there for 24 hours, that store walkthrough, that inspection was supposed to happen at 8 a.m. and I'm exhausted. I am tired. I'm so tired that when I'm standing up, I'm feeling nauseous, like I'm gonna throw up. And I thought, I gotta go home. How do I go on the store walkthrough with our district manager and I'm gonna be throwing up along the way? He, that's not, a, that's, I gotta save face. I need to go home. I need to get some rest. So I went to my store manager and I said, I'm, not, I'm just tired. I'm exhausted. I'm feeling sick. I need to go home. My departments are ready, but I gotta go get some rest. And she was so gracious. She let me leave. She was so kind about it. But I can remember on the drive home, I called my mom and I was upset about a few things. First of all, I was upset that the very thing that was gonna give me rest, that vacation that I was missing out on. I was missing out on that fun, I was missing out on that rest. I was upset that the very thing I stayed back for to make a great first impression, to do a good job, to, to have my area shining for this walk through, this inspection, that I was gonna miss that as well. But the thing I was most upset about, or I should say the thing I was most scared about is that I was genuinely afraid that if I went to sleep, I'm telling my mom this, if I go to sleep right now, I don't think I'm gonna wake up. I was that tired. My brain was hallucinating, telling me, if you go to sleep right now, you're not waking up from that sleep. Don't go to sleep. The very thing that was gonna give me rest, sleep, I was afraid of. I was afraid rest was gonna be my end. And rest is something that is a challenge for a lot of us, isn't it? We live in a culture and a society that tells us if we take a rest for one second, if we take too long of a break, that our future is going to be altered for the bad. We will get nowhere. We will fail and others will pass us. Don't ever rest. Don't sit. Don't stop. Keep going. Grind. No sleep. Grind. No sleep. You stop and you'll fail. It's in all these motivational quotes that we often see or hear, right? Maybe you've seen, maybe you've heard some of these but this one here, don't decrease the goal, increase the effort. Or this next one, don't stop when you're tired, stop when you're done. Or this one we've all seen, I'll sleep when I die. I'll sleep when I die. Or in my case, I'll die if I sleep. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> but it's the culture we live in, right? Work, Go, don't stop. You'll never get there if you stop. No breaks. You want a great future? Then don't rest. Work. And there's nothing wrong with a little motivation to keep us going. I know sometimes we need that little kick just to keep us pushing. But sometimes what we want 
All we need is just a little rest. It's just a breath. So today, we're going to look at Jesus. And we're going to find some rest in our future. Because a lot of us, when it comes to looking at our future, we don't feel restful, do we? We feel anxious. We feel depressed. We feel stressed out. We feel burdened. Well, what if we could trade all those feelings about our future and we could turn them into hope and turn them into rest? And here's why. Because good work is going to grow best in someone who knows how to rest. Good work is going to come from someone who knows how to rest. So let's try to do that today. Let's try to rest. And the first thing we need to do is we need to learn to rest and let him work. Rest while he works. Now, one thing that's about me that you'll, you'll, I'm, I'm just going to tell you now is that I am a pillow guy. I love my pillow. Does anybody else in here just like your favorite part about sleep your favorite, is your pillow? Yeah, I love my pillow. I can sleep on a firm mattress, a soft mattress. I can sleep on the ground. I don't prefer it as long as I have my pillow. Like it's my pillow. In fact, I can remember uh, going back through my 15 years of marriage. Health experts tell you change your pillow every one to two years. In 15 years of marriage, I've changed my pillow once, and it was only as of recently. Our pillows start to get, when you take that pillow sheet off, it starts to get nasty, doesn't it? It's like this picture here. It's like this meme that says, apparently I leak battery acid when I sleep. Because you take that sheet off and your pillow is just nasty. But it doesn't matter. It's my pillow. It's what gives me the best sleep. Well, the first verse we're going to be looking at today is Romans 8:28. And as I was saying earlier, Romans is a book of rest for the Christ follower, which makes Romans chapter 8, 28, a soft pillow where we can lay our tired heart. It's a verse where we can lay our tired heart, and it's a pillow that you can hang on to for a lifetime. Let's look at what Romans 8, 28 says. It says, and when we get to the red word, read that out loud with us. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. We know that God causes everything to work together for the good. What the Bible is telling us is that we don't have to make sense of it all. We don't have to worry about what's ahead, how it's going to work out because God's already doing it. In fact, even the bad stuff that happens in our lives, we often ask the question, why do bad things happen to good people? And there's some things that we'll, we'll never understand, that we'll never be able to explain, but we know that God can take a bad thing and he can turn it into something beautiful. And we can trust that he will do that in our lives because of his character in the past. He always has and he always will. Now, he doesn't necessarily say all things will work together for our total comfort. He doesn't promise that we'll be comfortable. Early in the series, we shared how the Bible tells us the only way to build endurance and resilience is through difficult situations. But what we find rest in is the fact that he promises, no matter what, no matter what, what has happened in our past, no matter what is to happen in our future, back to Romans 8, 28, that it will, it will be worked together for good. And last week we talked about sin and how sin in our lives, it can be destructive. It can bring hurt and pain to everyone around us. We mess up sometimes. It's our bad decisions. It's our bad choices. We live in a broken world. And because it's broken, we're going to endure some hard times. It's just how it is. But God wants us to know that he still has us in his hands. That he can take the broken, the messy, the hurt, the pain, and he can turn it for good. Because he wants to. He wants to do that for you. He wants to do that for me. Nothing can get in the way of his plans for us. We might make the road bumpy, but nothing will stop God from getting us to our ultimate destination. It's the situations from your past. It's the experiences in your future, and he works them all together for good. We can be okay with not knowing how he's connecting it all together. We can trust him because of his character. When you go back through your Bible, it's story after story where it seems that the world had somebody cornered. It had somebody down and it had somebody close to out. But God turned all of that and he used it for good in their lives and the lives of others for his glory. It's just who he is. It's what he does. And in our own lives, it's not always going to make sense. 
It won't always make sense. We something, see something bad and we think, God, how can this be for good? But when paired with something else, when part of his plan, he can take seemingly bad things in our lives and he can turn them into something beautiful. Here's a great picture of what I'm saying. There's a photographer from Boston named Stephen Dwayne. And Stephen one day went to his compost trash, his garbage. He looked inside and he thought, here's an incredible opportunity for a photo. He went and ran and got his camera, took a picture of his trash. He came back the next week and he did it again. He said, here's another opportunity for a photo. He took a picture of his trash. He did this week after week until Stephen built a very desired, a very popular photo collection. He took his compost, his trash, his garbage, and he made it into something beautiful. He took his compost, his trash, his garbage, he made it into a future for him. Here's a picture of, of Stephen's photos. As you can see here, there's a broken egg, maybe a rotten egg, there's a, an old banana peel. Sure, those things on their own, they're not very beautiful. They're not worthy of a picture. But when paired with everything else, it makes a beautiful photograph. When a reporter asked Stephen about his art and what gave him the inspiration, he said, you can look at beautiful items up against things that are decaying or breaking away or losing their beauty. And it gives you something more thought-provoking about our own transitory state of being. All of our transitory states, are, all of our states of being are transitory, aren't they? Meaning what we've experienced, where we've come from, who we've been, it's not permanent. God is doing something. Sure, our, our past might look like a mess. We might have some broken eggshells. We might have some, some rotten bananas. Situations and experiences on their own that might be ugly. It might resemble trash. But when paired with what God can do, it can become something beautiful. It can become something beautiful. Have you ever felt, have you ever felt like there's just something from your own past that's not so pretty? You know, something that just seemed to be compost or trash. Something that's blocking you from a beautiful, pic, uh, beautiful future. I mean, really, think about that for a second. Think about it. Is there, it could be a tragedy in your life. It could be a way that you felt handicapped. It might be someone or something that's made you feel like you're not enough. Like you're not good enough. Like you're not smart enough. Like you're not pretty enough. It might be an area where you feel like you're just deficient in a physical ability and an educational background. What you can rest in is that God's got you. You are already enough and he is already working out what you're worried about. Be expectant of his goodness. Confident that his purpose is good. It's like that compost analogy. There are things in our lives that on their own we would say that's bad, that's junk. That was straight trash. And because it's trash, because it's bad, it's just always going to be bad. But then God brings other opportunities for us. New situations, new experiences, and those things paired with the bad and all a part of his will, they end up turning into something beautiful, something good. Listen, just because you can't see it, it doesn't mean it's not already happening. God sees your pain and he gives you purpose. God sees your obstacles and he gives you opportunities. And we just keep trusting that it's for good. Not just because he tells us, because he's shown it in his character from time and time again, since the beginning of time, which brings me to another way we can find rest in our future. And that's that we trust in God's provision. Trust that God will provide. I can remember this one year that was really hard on Laura and I. It was early in our marriage and I was in between jobs. And because I was in between jobs, we just didn't have a whole lot of money. We were straight broke. I can remember it was early December. We're looking at our finances and we're not even sure how we're going to get food that month, how to get groceries, how we're going to eat as we're planning out what finances we do have. And I can remember just being stressed out because it's also December. We have Christmas presents to buy. You know, if there's family and friends that we want to make sure to get a little bit of something for. And if we don't have money for groceries, we definitely don't have money for the Christmas presents. So we're looking at our finances and we're stressing out. I can remember sitting around the dining room table and, and just full of worry, anxiety. And then Laura said, I think we just need to pray. I think we just need to stop for a second and pray. And so that's what we did. We prayed a bold prayer that God would show up in our finances, that he would find a way to provide. No joke, two days later, 
our mother and my mother-in-law, Laura's mother, Bobby, she showed up to our front door. We heard a knock on the door. We opened it. She has two weeks worth of groceries right there with her. She did not know our financial situation. We were very private about it. She just said, I wanted to do something nice for you guys. So I went out and bought groceries. God was already showing up and providing. And then two days after that, Two days after the groceries, I was at Kohl's and I can remember we were going to a Christmas party. I needed a shirt to wear to this Christmas party. I was shopping the clearance section, trying to be very money conscious. I get up to the register with a a cheap shirt and I'm I'm checking out and the cashier asked me, do you want to donate to whatever charity they were highlighting at the time? And I thought, oh, we don't have a whole lot of cash, but you know what? I'll go five bucks. She's like, great, with that $5, you get this raffle card that you can fill out. And if you win the raffle, you'll get a $500 Kohl's gift card. Now, I don't normally enter raffles because I think it's just a gimmick. They just want my email. They just want my phone number. They're going to blow me up with marketing. I'm not going to give them all that info. But this time, I was like, you know what? Might as well. So I filled it out. One week later, they called me that I had won that $500 Kohl's gift card. It took care of all of our Christmas presents. We were able to give Christmas presents to friends and family. God showed up. Now, side note to this whole story. I think that God loves to work through generosity, doesn't he? I mean, you saw it in that story. He just loved to work through generosity. But what I want you to get from that story, what what it was that God was doing is he was watching out for us. God had picked us up. He had picked up our burden all because we stopped, we asked, and we prayed a bold prayer. There's this verse that just seems to be burned into my memory for times like this. Times where we're struggling, times where I'm wondering, is everything just against me? It's like I have it on repeat or something. It's Romans 8, 31 through 32. We're going to put it up here, and when we get to the red words, if you'll say it out loud with us. But I feel like you're going to have no problem saying this one out loud with us. It says, what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? If God is for us, who could be against us? This is something that we say every single week here at Central. If there's ever a church that's championed this verse, it's this church, right? Every single week, we believe that. Now, if you stop and think about that verse for a second... Who could be against us? You might be able to start coming up with a long list of people or things that are against you, right? We tend to remember those people, those things that aren't for us. And we could list them out. But what Romans 8, 31 and 32 isn't saying is make a list and start dwelling on that list. No, it's saying you might have your list, but who cares about that list? You've got a God that's on your side. You're living in God's direction. You can be against me, but I'm a son or a daughter of the living God. I've got a bigger purpose. The haters can hate, but I've got God on my side, right? That's exactly what that verse is saying. And the reason we've championed that verse, the reason we say it every close of every experience for as long as Pastor Judd's been our pastor is because when you're confident you have God on your side, anything is possible. Just go back through the Bible, the stories in the Bible. Daniel, he stared down lions in a den because he had confidence he had a God who was for him and who would deliver him. David, he stared down a bear, a lion, a giant with a slingshot and some rocks because who could ever be against him that was bigger than his God? Peter walked on water because he knew and trusted that Jesus was for him. And you might be saying, yeah, but Peter started to sink. He started to doubt. I didn't see another disciple that had the confidence to get out of that boat. How did they accomplish such things? They knew that they had a God that was for them. They had extreme confidence. I think we need some extreme confidence in the fact that God is for us. If we're ever going to be able to rest when it comes to our future. We need some extreme confidence. What is it that you need God to give you? What is it or who is it that you feel you need God to show up in today, to show you that he's got you and he's for you? Is it you need a job? Well, then ask God for a job. Can you not pay your rent? Ask God to show up and give you direction in your finances. Are you tired of being single? Ask God to bring someone into your life. Is it a health issue in your life? Ask for his healing. Is your marriage struggling? Ask him to show up in your marriage. Do you want these things now? Are you tired of waiting? Well, then ask him for patience. 
God, let your will be done. What do you want for my life? We have to be expectant of his provision. We have to be confident that he is enough. Be confident in prayer that he will give it to you. James 4, 2 tells us you have not because you don't ask God for it. Ask him. He gave you Jesus. Won't he give you the other things? Go back to Romans 8, 32 real quick. Look at this. Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? He gave us Jesus. He gave us everything. Why wouldn't he show up in the littler things, right? Kohl's, they gave me a $500 gift card. Would it be silly for me to ask for the little sleeve, the little paper sleeve for that gift card to go in after they're giving me $500? No, you'd say that's nothing. My mother-in-law showed up at our house with two weeks worth of groceries. Would it be silly for me on the way out if I said, hey, can I have a stick of gum? No, that's not silly. That's not an inappropriate ask. God gave us his all. So the things that you feel are against you, although they're big to us, they are small to God. So you cry out to him with confidence. You put your eyes on Jesus. Whatever your situation, stop stressing yourself out. You've carried what you can carry for as long as you can carry it. Now, it doesn't mean that it's not still work. It's still important to work, to grind. But what we rest from, we rest from worry. Because we can worry or we can trust God. But we can't do both. We can worry or we can trust God, but we can't do both. You tend to worship what you worry. And when you worship what you worry, you're not worshiping God. And the last way we can rest is we can know that God's got our future. We can know where he sits. Know where he sits. Jesus is already sitting on what or, you, or who you feel is blocking you. He's sitting on your behalf, at God's right hand. He's our intercessor. Look at what it tells us in Romans 8, 33 and 34. It says, who dare, dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us, pleading for us. Why do we feel the need to stand and fight for victories over others when he's already sitting as our victor? We said it last week, we're not fighting for victory, we're fighting from victory. When you put your trust and faith in Jesus, when you name him your Lord and Savior, he's sitting at the right hand of God saying, they're mine. I know they have their accusers. But I've defeated those accusations. I know they have a past, but I'm going to use that for good. I've covered them. We have to know where he sits. Because he defeated death on the cross, our future, it's safe. He's sitting in heaven, providing a way for us through any problem and any obstacle. The Bible shouts out, death, where is your sting? That's right. Our future's covered. Not even death can separate us from the love of God. Now, I want to tell you about a friend of mine named Lisa. I asked her if she'd be willing to share her story. I, she's got a, an incredible story. I asked her if she would just be willing to, to, to basically tell me, like, hey, what did you feel like it was in your life that were the obstacles that were ahead of your future? What do you feel like was against you that was blocking your future? So I can help tell the story of you breaking through those obstacles of God providing your beautiful future. And here's her words. She said, my home had a lot of domestic violence and alcoholism. My mother physically abused me, and it progressively got worse until she was killed in a car accident. I was 11 at the time and in the car with her. I felt responsible for the accident, thinking I should have died instead of her. Around the same time, I went to trial for my teacher's repeated sexual abuse. He was not the only person to sexually assault me, but he was the last one that I told anybody about. He was, uh, no one believed me until he pled guilty. As a teen, I used alcohol and drugs to numb the rage I felt from all the pain. Leading to promiscuity and self-harm, I tried to end my life multiple times on the anniversary of my mother's death. One day I walked into Central after quitting hard drugs. I was now going to be good. 
When I had my own children, my world crumbled when I realized I was becoming my mother. I began to physically abuse my kids too. The unforgiveness I carried kept me in the same pattern. I was drinking every day and my blackouts were becoming more frequent. My life was unraveling, unmanageable, and my husband didn't trust me anymore. Finally, I stopped pretending I had it all together. Finally, letting myself be seen, I found a community where I felt safe to confess what was really going on and share about the abuse I swore that I would take to my grave. The acceptance and hope I received in these moments catapulted the change in my life. It confronted the lies I believed about how God saw me. I'm not condemned to the pattern of this world. I'm not what I've done or what's happened to me. I am his. I am now 12 years sober. My children now know Jesus is real because he changed their mom. Because of the healing I received, I will never stop helping people see that they can truly be free. One of the best parts of her story is that Lisa Wakefield, she's a pastor on the central team now, helping others find freedom from their past and hope for their future. Here's a picture of Lisa and her beautiful family. God took the brokenness. God took the broken eggshells. He took the, the rotten bananas. He took all the bad. And he created something beautiful. He created a beautiful future. All the pain, all the brokenness from her past. And he made a future that he ultimately uses every day for the good of others and for the good of his kingdom. And he can do that for you too. He can do that for you. But listen, our past, it's never gonna stay in the past if we keep letting it negatively affect our present. We have to give it to him. Why? Because we can rest knowing that he's working. The mess that we are, the bad and horrible situations in our lives, he will use it and he'll turn it into something beautiful. We don't need to worry. We just need to ask. We need to let him carry what we're not supposed to carry anymore. And when someone tells us we're not enough, we don't have to stand and fight. We can be confident that Jesus is already sitting over them or sitting over it at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. The good news about your future, God's got it. He's got it. So we can rest in that. In Matthew 6, 34, Jesus tells him himself, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. And how do we do it? Well, he actually tells us in the verse before, Matthew 6, 32, he says, seek the kingdom of God. Above all else, live righteously and he will give you everything you need. He will give you everything you need. Central Life has a, a brand new worship song called Tomorrow that we've been singing, worshiping King together lately. And the lyrics go, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. You are God and you're in control. My soul will not be troubled. Do you believe that? I mean, really, do you believe it? Can you rest? Can you rest knowing God can take what feels like the ugly, the broken, the trash in your life and he can make it into something beautiful? Can you trust in his provision for, you li in your, for your life? Can you stop worrying about knowing what's in your future? And can you rest in who has your future? I wanna end this experience a little bit differently today. So can you do this for me? Can you just close your eyes? Can you put your hands out? Just open-handed, put your hands out. Now with your eyes closed, with your hands forward, I just want you to think about what or who is blocking you from your future right now. What or who are you worried about? What's causing you anxiety? Who do you feel like is against you? Think about it and put it in your hands right now. Whatever it is, just put it in your hands. And if you're ready, I'm gonna lead us through a prayer where we're just gonna give it to God. We're gonna hand him what or who is blocking us so we don't have to carry that anymore. God, I know we don't have to physically hold what we're worried about, what we're anxious about, what's blocking us, what's affecting our future, who's against us, for you to see it. 
we know that you know our thoughts. We know that you know who and what is against us. So right now, with everyone's hands out, I pray that you take that, Father. That those that are truly ready to give it to you, Father, just remove it from them. They're tired of carrying it on their own. I'm tired of carrying what I carry on my own. Take it, Jesus. Give it to him, church. Just let him have it. Remove this from us, Father. We want to walk in our future that you have for us because we know that that future is good. We know that that future, we have purpose. We know that that future is beautiful. Take the things from our past and do something with them, Father, that only you can do. Give us that beautiful future that you promise us. It's in your son's precious and holy name we pray. Amen.